Welcome to the second episode in a Legendarium series about the Little Ice Age. In part two, Frost and Famine, we will talk about how the potato came to Europe. It could have helped the Europeans to adapt even better to the colder weather of the Little Ice Age, but Europeans didn't much care for it. In the end, it took more weather changes caused by a volcanic eruption, along with hardships caused by the Thirty Years' War, to force Europeans to rethink their eating habits. In the first episode, we talked about how the colder weather of the Little Ice Age forced Europeans to move from grain-based agriculture to vegetables because vegetables were more likely to survive cold weather. A new crop arrived in Europe during the early 1500s that would have helped them to feed themselves. Spanish conquistadors who seized control of South America encountered a new tuber called the potato. In the Inca Empire, it served as an ideal food for the large working class who built and tended mountain terraces and constructed stone palaces for the Inca elite because it could be grown on very little acreage yet had great nutritional value. While potatoes came to Europe very soon, no peasant farmers showed an interest in them. To people accustomed to cereal agriculture, food that grew under the ground already carried a certain stigma. Even worse, potatoes tended to be covered with dirt, tasted bland, and their plants resembled the poisonous belladonna. At first, no one took an interest in the potato except for aristocratic gardeners who used it to pretty up their ornamental gardens. Ireland became the first European nation to adopt the potato. After Irish farmers began growing spuds in 1590, the population of Ireland began a sudden climb. The year the Irish adopted the potato, the island had a population of one million. By the time of the potato famine over 250 years later, the island was home to eight million people. Ironically and tragically, the potato crop made it possible for landlords to ruthlessly exploit their Irish tenants. Landlords could extract almost all of the produce except the potato as the spud's extraordinary nutritional value in proteins and vitamins meant it could almost single-handedly support human life. Indeed, during the early 1800s, medical examiners described the Irish as being among the healthiest people in Europe despite pervasive poverty. On February 19, 1600, nature helped to change Europe's mind about what they considered fit to eat. A tremendous volcanic eruption at Huaynaputina, located in modern-day southern Peru, drove mud flows that destroyed villages for miles around. It also spewed a vast column of smoke and ash into the atmosphere. Switzerland and the Baltic countries endured extraordinarily cold winters from 1600 to 1602. The 1601 wine harvest in France came late, and wine production collapsed completely in Germany and colonial Peru. In China, peach trees bloomed late. Lake Suba in Japan had its earliest freezing date in 500 years. This eruption also caused a marked worsening of the already precarious situation in Europe. The population had not only recovered from the initial shock of the Little Ice Age, but grown from its pre-Black Death levels to 112 million people. Now with crop yields dropping, Europe found itself in the same position it had at the start of the Little Ice Age. Their population had grown greatly in good times, but now they struggled to feed everybody in bad times. While the phrase Little Ice Age makes one think of the frozen wastes of Russia come to temperate England and balmy Italy, it actually meant a climate of extremes, with blistering summers, freezing winters, and unpredictable rainfall. During the harsh winters, birds froze to death in mid-air and fell to the ground. Famished wolves with no deer to eat came out of the forest and prowled around the walls of villages, desperate for horses, cows, or even men to eat.
The spells of extreme cold and heat made even the growing of hardy vegetables precarious. The number of famine years grew steadily. They must rank as some of the worst ordeals a human can endure. Peasants might have to sell all their clothing, being reduced to a dangerous state of exposure during the winter months. In a desperate bid to keep from eating the seed corn for next year, peasants turned to tearing bark from trees to eat, along with consuming roots, grass, and even clay. In some countries, strangers walked into villages and only reappeared on someone's dinner table. Starving peasants tore down gallows, removed bodies from the nooses, and ate warm flesh cooked over their fires. In the end, it took the Thirty Years' War fought throughout Central Europe and Northern Italy to change people's minds about the potato. The mercenary armies of the era tended to fight in open fields, which often meant farmland. That in turn meant wholesale trampling and destruction of crops, which only worsened hunger and hardship during the war in part because potato plants remained underground and were exceptionally hardy, farmers throughout Europe finally turned to the spud as a source of food. This proved to be a critical decision, as potatoes required little acreage but provided great nutritional value. Without them, it would have been impossible for Europe to feed its large urban workforce during the Industrial Revolution. London's frost fairs became one of the few merry events to come out of this new phase of the Little Ice Age. Builders had spaced the piers of medieval London Bridge close together, so pieces of ice wedged in between and dammed up the river, making it likely to freeze. And in 1607, it did just that. A pedestrian could make his way from Southwark to London without ever getting his feet wet. Londoners began holding Thames Frost Fairs every winter from 1607 to 1814. They made for a grand spectacle, with the frozen river filled with hastily built shops and ice skating rinks. To keep warm, many shopkeepers built fires within their tents, an obvious hazard that led to more than one shop going up in smoke. Fairgoers also enjoyed soccer matches and bowling. During the great winter of 1683 to 1684, even the seas of southern Britain froze solid up to two miles from shore. It became so severe that it completely stopped naval traffic in the North Sea and English Channel. During that winter, Londoners held the Blanket Fair. Along with the usual attractions, this particular fair saw horse and coach races on the strong ice, games of bull baiting, and puppet plays in a carnival-like atmosphere fueled by plenty of booze. King Charles II himself showed up and enjoyed a spit-roasted ox cooked over an open fire. By the time of the fair's end in 1814, even traveling elephants showed up as an attraction. The ice was strong enough to support even those great beasts. Thank you for watching this episode of The Legendarium. If you enjoyed it, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comment section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.